Okay, so what I want to talk to you about are uh, first cognitively stimulating activities. What are they? And um, I want to tell you what some evidence is about that and how it might influence cognitive aging. I'll talk to you about social engagement and what that means and what are some evidence for that in uh, healthy aging. And then we'll talk about some recommendations. Um, but just like Dr. Carlson said, um, there are no proven, um, proven methods for cognitive, preventing cognitive decline. But there are some nice uh, studies that are going on that are showing associations that are really promising about engaging your mind and engaging your social uh, life. So what are cognitively stimulating activities? These are considered to be activities that challenge a person's ability to think. So you're challenging your brain. And this could be by doing a crossword puzzle, for example. It could be uh, doing woodworking activities, following plans like that. Um, or it could be learning a new musical instrument or learning a new language. These are all considered to be cognitively stimulating activities. And so I want to tell you about the evidence so far. Uh, there's a lot of evidence um, in terms of associations between um, cognitively stimulating activities and slower decline in memory and other thinking skills. And so when we think about these studies, there are two types of studies. One is an observational study where we just follow people over time and ask them questions about what kinds of activities they do over time, and then look at is their cognition changing uh, according to those activities. The other kind of study that we look at are controlled trials, where we actually put somebody on an intervention, tell them to do a certain type of cognitive activity, and then see if they change under those kinds of controlled conditions. So those are the two types of studies I'm going to talk about. So the first type, the observational type, where we're looking at groups of people over time, um, they'll fill out questionnaires. Many of you have filled these questionnaires out uh, time and time again. And they look something like this. How often do you engage in the following kinds of activities? Never, sometimes, very often, every day. So playing chess, bridge, or knowledge games, solving puzzles, doing arts and crafts, or leading discussions. These are some of the types of questions that we might ask you if you're in an observational study. And so, um, as I said, there are lots, lots and lots of studies that show uh, positive associations between people who engage in these activities more uh, and positive cognitive outcomes. This is one study that was done in 2002, and um, this group looked at uh, Catholic nuns and priests and brothers from a variety of sites throughout the United States. And this kind of group is attractive to look at because they tend to lead similar lifestyles. Um, they might uh, live in, in a similar kind of place. They might eat the ki same kinds of foods. So these groups are very attractive to look at. And what this group found, uh, so they followed these people from 1994 to 2001. And what they found is that the participants who said they engaged in more frequent cognitively stimulating activities had a 33% reduced risk of developing de dementia than uh, those people who participated in fewer activities. So this was a promising and quite large study of 801 uh, participants. So another study um, was similar. It was um, at the Rush Memory and Aging Project. So 700 adults were followed for five years. And the same kinds of questions were asked to these adults over the, that time period. And um, so this graph shows um, the study year on the bottom line. And so uh, from year zero, when they first started, to their fourth year in the study, 
And then on the, um, the vertical line, it tells you about what risk they had of developing dementia by the end of this five-year period. And so the, the dotted line and where it says cognitively inactive, those adults who didn't do a lot of cognitive activity had um, a, a much more increased risk of being a person who developed dementia than those who were cognitively active in this study. So um, also here in Wisconsin, we are also asking you these kinds of questions and looking at these things. And so Dr. Janitis, this is the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, which many of you uh, know about. It's been going on for um, over 15 years now. And uh, Dr. Janitis in 2013 looked at 762 RAP participants and she only looked at one question about how often do you play games like checkers, crosswords, and other puzzles um, more frequently. So the people who said they pr played those games more frequently tended to have higher scores on the memory tests in general. So this was kind of one snapshot in time. Another study from the Wisconsin Registry from Alzheimer's Prevention looked at brain volume. Just like um, Dr. Rogelski talked about, we can look at and measure how um, much volume or how thick the brain is. And so um, in this graph, again, they're looking at that same question about games and checkers and crossword puzzles. And those people who reported doing that more frequently, and that would be the people in those blue bars, had higher brain volumes than the people who reported doing those less frequently. So some very interesting associations. And Dr. Carlson, Dr. Rogalski talked about this amyloid in the brain. So here's another study that um, asked about cognitive activities and found that um, people who reported participating more in these activities seem to have, at least in this study, less amyloid in their brain. So interesting associations. We can't say, though, that these things, these cognitive activities caused these changes. We just are saying that there's some kind of association, and it's very difficult to tease those things out. So that's why um, we want to do more clinical trials where we put people on a prescription of a cognitive activity of some type and see what effect that has in a more controlled condition. So this is a really nice study um, that looked at um, sustained engagement um, in different activities, and it depended upon whether or not this was a new skill for these people. So there were different groups. There was a quilting group, and the people in that group had to never have done quilting before, so they were learning a new skill. There was also a photography group, and then there was a control group. And so these groups met, and they learned these new skills for 16 hours a week, where they had this direct training. And um, basically what they found is that the group um, who um, was in the photography group and the quilting group, both of those groups uh, were doing better on their cognitive scores um, than the, the control group was. And so there was some kind of positive effect of this uh, intervention. It's hard to say what component of that intervention caused this improved cognitive function. It could have been that they were in a social uh, environment together and they were, um, we don't, we can't really tease that out in studies like this, but we can try. And so I'm gonna talk about that cognitive and that social piece in a minute. But a very nicely done study and um, it talks about activities that you might like to learn. So um, this you may have heard about in the news, and you may be um, seeing lots of advertisements about um, doing computerized cognitive training. And this study made the news um, because it uh, had a component of this computerized cognitive training in it. 
So this was a large study called ACTIVE. And in this study, they looked at over 2,000 uh, healthy adults between the ages of 65 and 94 years old. And so there was a treatment group and a control group who didn't have the treatment. And they had 10 sessions. And they learned uh, memory strategies. Um, and that was more a person-to-person -person training. But then they also had this speed of processing training, which is a computerized task where they um, play this game on the computer. This game in particular was called Brain HQ, which is also a commercially available game uh, like Lumosity that you may, may have heard of as well. And so these participants um, did this for 10 sessions. And then the study followed these people over um, many, many years, 10 years, in fact. And so it's a little hard to see, but it's that top line with the open circle there. That's the group that did that computerized um, speed of processing training. And um, what this is measuring is how well they're doing their daily activities. They answered questionnaires over 10 years of time, and they report just doing better with their activities of daily living, the group that had that speed of processing or cognitive training. Um, the other groups uh, compared to the control group also did better. Uh, so this intervention piece seems to have some promising effect. Now this is in normally healthy, healthy aging people. Um, it's not measuring people with cognitive impairment, which is something that really needs to be studied more to see if we can slow uh, cognitive decline in people who are uh, showing impairment. So uh, what about that computerized cognitive training? Um, what we need really are more studies to uh, recommend that. Just based on that one study alone, um, we don't have enough evidence to say that yes, you should be purchasing these computerized programs and doing them at home. We need to really show that these skills actually make a difference in your life. So if you play this speed of processing game, we want to know, can you still, does that in, uh, elongate your ability to drive, for example, where you have to have a, a fast reaction time? So this, these are the kinds of questions we really want to measure. It's hard to do, but it's something that's needed before we can recommend these kinds of games. Um, we also need studies that actually show changes uh, in the brain, and we can measure those things, as we saw by our previous speakers. And so that would be another promising um, way of showing that these, these games work. Um, moving on, though, um, the question is, so, you know, I want to talk to you more about this social engagement piece. And so there's a lot of other studies that are going on, but a lot of them have double components where they're actually looking at not only cognitive training, but also a social component. So there's a dance training study that is going on currently, acting and singing, um, computerized training plus learning a new language, uh, and then there's some study going on about looking at uh, how to use a tablet, uh, an iPad, for example, and would that help? And so there's lots of questions being asked. Um, but again, it's hard to tease out this social engagement um, piece, and it's a really important piece of what we think is uh, part of what's going on in, in these associations. So social engagement, um, we look at a couple of things about that. One thing is the actual activities that you might do, where you might meet friends, um, attend events or functions, volunteer. We also want to know about your social network. How many people do you have that you can count on? And um, what, what resources do you have in terms of social supports? And social support refers to people that you really feel you can count on, you feel close to, and they're people who make up that social network. So social engagement activities, does this count? <laughs> and how about this? 
<laughs> and um, I'm going, I scoured the literature to see if I could find something about being a Packer fan and social engagement. Um, I couldn't find anything, but I'm gonna say yes, it does count. <laughs> I just earned points, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So some, some observational studies about social engagement, there are a lot of, of wonderful positive associations uh, between people who report that they have more support, less loneliness, than people who uh, have less support. So these are the types of questions you might be asked on these questionnaires. How often do you go to sporting events like Packer games or music events, volunteering, church or other spiritual meetings? And then how many people can you count? How many people you have that you feel you can really count on for support? And so we see that, um, you know, again, these social activities most likely have a cognitive component to them. Um, and so we think that's part of the mechanism about this, but also we wonder if social support is actually also reducing stress, which might improve cognitive function as well. So there are a couple of theories behind that. So this is just a list of uh, lots of studies that are going on um, or that have gone on. And basically, they, they all show that more social engagement is associated with better cognitive function over time. And there are some intervention studies as well, not just observational studies. And um, this study in particular happened in Finland, and it was 235 adults. 117 of them uh, received an intervention that included social activities where they actually went on outings, they had discussion groups, um, and then they also did therapeutic writing and exercise and art. So they did a lot of socializing. And they compared this with a group who had normal adult daycare um, routines. And they found that this group um, had cognitive scores that improved. The intervention group actually improved over time. So what the field is really moving toward is what Dr. Carlson mentioned. And that's putting it together. Um, why should we tease it out when we can actually put things together and look at what is the combination? Uh, what effect is the combination of these things that we think are good for us? What is it going to do? And this is um, the finger study that Dr. Carlson mentioned. And um, this had some really promising results. It was a large study of Finnish adults and it was a controlled trial, but it was multimodal. So they got, in, they got advice about taking blood pressure medicine. They had socialization. They had cognitive training. They learned strategies for memory improvement. And there was a control group who also had health advice and counseling only, but they didn't get this other um, more multifaceted intervention. And um, we're seeing in this group that uh, the group who's getting the full intervention um, really is doing better in, in various cognitive domains over time. So very exciting results. And because of that, more studies like this are now popping up, including here in the US. And this US study is uh, currently enrolling people, and it's called the US pointer study. And so it's kind of an offshoot of the finger study. And so they named it pointer. And um, it's a very similar kind of, uh, it's sort of modeled after this finger study and um, collaborating with that. There are other um, studies that are multimodal that I list here on the slide. So what are the recommendations? Um, keep your brain active. But choose activities that you actually want to do, things that you liked doing maybe at one point in your life, and kind of let them fall away. Maybe pick those back up again. And the reason we say that is because these are things that you're more likely to continue to do if you like them. Um, cognitive activities that have a social component is going to give you a two for one. And then cognitive activities that have social and physical components, like a dance class or an aerobics class, where you're learning steps, 
um, is a three for one. So it's, uh, these are things that we really recommend that you do. Other ideas, uh, you have this in your packet, some ideas for cognitive activities and some other ideas for social activities. Um, but again, the emphasis really is on things that you think you'll enjoy and that you'll repeat. It's not a one-time deal. It's something that we think you need to do over and over again and also to repeat and, and to engage your brain in different ways. So here are some websites that will um, be helpful, the AARP, the Alzheimer's Association, the NIH. And I'll leave you with a myth um, that you cannot learn new complex skills like a new language when you're older. The truth is that people of all ages can learn new things, including a new language. There's studies to show this, or a new musical instrument. But it takes a desire to do so and a lot of practice. And so I'd like to thank uh, everyone uh, at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, all of the participants, especially in aging and Alzheimer's research, especially uh, here in Wisconsin. Thank you so much.